Very good to be here. You can take off the headphone now. Got many things to talk about today. And I was asked to talk about some basic principles of animal behavior. Now, the horse in this situation is feeling fear. He suddenly had the saddle fall off. And fear is a proper scientific word. It's been used in the neuroscience literature for a long time. And I think maybe the cowboy, he has some uh, bruised pride. Calm animals are much easier to handle. When cattle get fearful and upset, they are more difficult to sort because they stick together. And it takes 20 or 30 minutes for them to calm down. So if you get in a situation where your cattle get really fearful and upset, and they're brought into the corrals, it would be a good idea to let them um, settle down for 20 minutes. It takes time for fearful animals to calm down. And there are differences in the temperament or the personality of an animal. And my first graduate student, Bridget Boisonnet, years ago, did a study, and she found that cattle that got agitated in the, in the uh, restrainer, in the, the head restrainer, uh, gained less weight. And animals that run fast out of uh, restrainers gain less weight. Calm genetics uh, gain, uh, gain more weight. Now, I was out at Dr. Zanella's lab yesterday, and I learned about some interesting experiments that they've done. Fearful cattle are less dominant at the feed trough. The low fear, calm cattle, they'll knock other cattle away from the feed trough. And uh, that's a very interesting finding. I just learned about that yesterday. Um, how can you tell if an animal's calm when you're handling animals? If he's got nice brown eyes, he's probably calm. Uh, in the Bostaurus breeds, probably need to do more work in some of your Indicus cattle. If you have animals in the race or in the um, restrainer in this and the tail is switching, they're getting fearful. If they are defecating or just you know manure pooping, I will not use the American nasty word for pooping, uh, the animals are getting scared because you scared the poop out of them. The first thing you'll see is the heads will go up. I do a lot of talks for our animal science students and our veterinary students, and it's important that they recognize the sign that the horse might be getting ready to bite, the cattle would be getting ready to kick. And one of those signs is tail swishing. And then the bison, a little different, when the tail is up, he is, gets very dangerous. But in the goat, when the tail is up, he's happy. This is where different species can have different signs. And what's happy in goat is dangerous when the bison, the American bison, does it. Uh, animals will associate um, something bad that happened in their past to something they were either seeing or hearing when the bad thing happened. I uh, worked with a horse uh, that was afraid of black cowboy hats because during a veterinary procedure, uh, somebody had thrown alcohol in his face, horrible, and the person who did that had a black cowboy hat. White cowboy hat was good, black cowboy hat was bad. It was specific because the animal stored that memory as a picture. It's really important to look at what the ears of animals are doing. Yeah, you know, at the airport, they have the radar that um, looks for airplanes. Well, animals watch things with their ears. Which way are they pointing their ears? The horse has an ear pointed at me, taking the picture. And the horse also has an ear on the zebra. They'll point the ears at different things. Put the ears forward, it's usually positive. Ears are back, uh, negative. And there's some French research that when the ears are kind of in a neutral position, it's a positive emotion. There's eye white, and I recommend not using nose tongs. Nose tongs hurt. And then the next time you try to use them, the animal is going like this because he remembers it. Use a halter or a head collar to hold the animal. 
Now, this slide shows the bad effects of rough handling of pigs, especially right before slaughter. If you use electric prodders, many times, the lactate levels triple, quadruple, the glucose levels triple and quadruple. Uh, one of my students, Lily Calloway Edwards, found that if you poke pigs with electric prods in the last five minutes, the slaughterhouse, you get um, high lactate, you're gonna get lower meat quality. That last five minutes, you can wreck pork. It's that simple. And, uh, and the more squealing that goes on, if the pigs are squealing in that last five minutes, you're gonna have meat quality issues. Now a question that people ask is, do animals have emotions? Yes, they do. And let's look at some of the simple evidence. I do a lot of talks with businesses and with farmers. I have to make things simple. There's the drug Prozac. Yes, and it does work on dogs. Works really well. So that's an indicator there that maybe their emotions have some similarity to our emotions. The neurotransmitters, which Dr. Zanella was talking about, are similar. And the brain regions where emotions come from are the same. I just love the Jack Panskep. I need to spell that name out for you, but maybe you can see it at the bottom of the slide, Jack Panskep. The seven basic emotional systems in animal brains. And you can see the, the name there. You can look that up online. And there's seven basic systems. And there's little um, areas of the brain for each one of these systems. Now you have fear. When the saddle fell off the horse, he got fearful. And some animals genetically are high fear. Their heart rate and their stress hormones will go up more than an animal that's low fear. Then you have anger. And then you have uh, panic or separation distress. You take the calf away from the mother or the lamb away from the mother, and they're going, bah, 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 uh, vocalizing. Um, that's separation distress. Separation distress is a separate brain system than fear. They're two separate things. Now, when you do painful things to pigs and cattle, pigs will squeal, cattle will bellow or moo. Sheep, when you do painful things, do nothing. They are not calm. They do not show it. That's a species difference. But when you take the lamb away from the mother, do you get vocalization because that is the separation stress. Now, seek is the emotion of um, sort of how active you are. For example, one black Labrador dog loves to chase the ball. Chase the ball, chase the ball. Another Labrador is bred for a service dog, for somebody in a wheelchair. Heavy boned, calm, not interested in the ball. So one is a high seek, the other is a low seek. Each one of these traits you can adjust it genetically, sort of like a music mixing board of emotion, just like you have up there at the sound place. Then, of course, you have sex, and sometimes that's a higher drive in some animals than others. Then you have the mother-young nurturing, licking, you know, making sure to nurse the animal. Uh, this is the oxytocin system. And then you have play. And there is neuroscience that shows very clearly that these systems exist. One of the problems we have in science is people just stay inside their disciplines. We, in the US, we call it staying inside their silos. In other words, veterinarians are not reading neuroscience journals. This research has been in the neuroscience journals for years. And I, just, I really, really like the Jack Petskep Seven Emotions. And when I look at the cattle temperament studies, it fits right in with this. Now, some other research that shows they have emotions is Gregory Burns. You can see the name up there, Gregory Burns at Emory University. You can look up his papers. He trained dogs to lay still in an MRI machine for 15 minutes. And when they smell their favorite person, the reward centers, 
the happiness centers in the brain light up, shows that they do have emotions. Okay, now there's different types of stressful, nasty situations. You can have fear, you can have separation distress, two different things, and then you can have pain. That's a third thing. Or they might be just hot or cold or tired. Now, do animals feel pain? Dr. Sanoa talked about this. Now, the studies I like to talk about are the self-medication studies. Because an animal, when it has a sore joint and it's all inflamed and it's all nasty, they will drink bitter tasting drug uh, that kills the pain. And when the joint heals, the rat or the chicken will stop eating or drinking the bitter substance. It's called a self-medication experiment. And both mammals, and the research was done in rats, and chickens will self-medicate for pain. Yes, it hurts when you cut things off of animals without pain relief. Now, we've bred dogs to be this hyper-social animal. They need people. So if you want to get them to stop barking at the animal shelter, you need to have people come in every day and play with them for 45 minutes. And look at the difference in the um, level of um, salivary cortisol. In other words, we were able to show biological measurement. And uh, in the US, we have a thing called thunder shirt or pressure wrap. You have dogs that are afraid of thunderstorms. This is most likely to happen in dogs that live in houses and never go outside, and they're afraid of everything. And you put this pressure garment on, and when they were uh, left alone, they spent less time looking at the door, waiting for a person to come back, or they, um, then, and the heart rate went down. Now, what's different between wolves and dogs? The main thing is we've bred the dog to be hyper-social, to want to please us. That's genetic difference. And um, if you give the wolf, a tame wolf, and a, and a dog, a, a problem, like how to open a box full of food, a wolf watches the other wolf and opens the box. The domestic dog is so busy looking at us, asking us for help, that he doesn't get the box open. It's really, really social. And uh, dogs also will look at people in a way that wolves don't. Uh, they don't, um, wolves don't pick up some of the cues. We've bred them to be different. Okay, um, there's some neuroscience research. And some of this neuroscience research is old. And in 1997, I reviewed the literature on fear research for the veterinarians and the animal scientists. I have a paper called Assessment of Stress During Handling and Transport. Nobody had done that before. And to bring out these old neuroscience papers to show that, yes, animals do feel fear. And it's been proven. Very invasive experiments. Uh, nobody's going to do these experiments now. But they show that fear is real. And if you remove the fear center, rats are no longer afraid of cats. If you were a rat, you wouldn't live very long if you were not afraid of cats. Monkeys normally, if I took a monkey and I turned him loose in this auditorium, he would run up the curtain, then he'd jump to this bar, this thing up here. He would be up at the ceiling. That's a normal monkey behavior. You put him in a scary place like this auditorium. But if you remove the fear center, he's going to be exploring all the people here because you took out all the fear. Now, what I'm trying to show you in this slide is that when you force cattle or other animals to do things, you get more fear stress. Rough handling, screaming and yelling, dogs biting cattle. Uh, your cortisol levels are going to go way, way up. And down at the bottom of the graph, when animals cooperate with handling, and at the bottom of the graph, I've got antelope that we trained to cooperate with blood testing. I have trained shape to line up and wait to go in the tilt table for foot trimming. And I gave them a little reward of feed. If I'm going to put an animal in a restraint device repeatedly, I've got to give it a trait. 
And the sheep really liked about one little spoonful of sweet horse feed with molasses, and they would line up to go into the, uh, into the chute. So when animals cooperate with you, you have less fear stress. And there's also genetic differences. Some animals get scared more easily, but if they're handled carefully, then they don't get scared. And here are antelope. And we worked on training antelope, and nobody thought it would be done. Now, since this animal gets scared and frightened easily, you have to introduce each new thing very slowly. For example, it took 10 days to train the antelope to tolerate a sliding door suddenly opening. So the first day, I pulled the rope that opened the door, and the door opened this much. And then that antelope orients and looks. That's all we did that day. Because when you see a deer or some other animal orient, the brain is now making a decision. Do I keep watching or do I run off? There's a decision in the brain. There's actually a switch in the brain. Make the decision. The next day, first day, I opened the door this much. Second day, this much. And when the animal oriented, it stopped. And at the end of 10 days, I could just jerk open the door. But we had to very carefully habituate it to the equipment and, and very carefully, because if we had frightened it early in the training, we would have never have gotten it to go in the box. Now, it's important to acclimate animals to handling. I mean, yesterday we ran some heifers through the facility, and during the practical uh, training, we're going to use new cattle for each training. Because if I'm going to get them, train them to go through the facility, I have to reward them. If you're going to make animals go through a handling facility more than once in a day, they need to be fed uh, some treat, something that they're going to like. Jeffrey Hudson, years ago, found that little bits of barley, sheep would go through the handling facility uh, really willingly. And animals will learn to tolerate maybe a head holder. A little bit uncomfortable, but you can't train them to tolerate something that really hurts. I saw some cattle one time where too many students had palpated up their rear end, and their rear end was very sore, and they refused to go in the work area. Yeah, you cannot train animals to tolerate really painful stuff. Uncomfortable stuff, yes, but not really painful. And when some research was done by one of our researchers in, in, in Idaho, and he found that if you got young heifers just used to walking through the facility, then when they did artificial insemination, they got better conception rates. Spending some time walking amongst the heifers to reduce the flight zone so they wouldn't be as wild. And um, research on sheep and cattle has shown the first trip on the truck is scary. It's really novel. You know, second and third trip, they learn they get off. And then you have cattle where a truck is used to switch pastures. And when they see the truck, they come running because they know that they're going to be taken to a better pasture. Fear is a proper scientific term. Now, one scientist, and he's my age now, Paul Hemsworth, has done a lot of work on the importance of stockmanship. Stockmanship is really important. And sows that were afraid of people, that would you know, move away from people, had less piglets. Fearful animals, animals that are afraid of people, are less productive animals. He also found that when people like their animals, this was in pigs, that they had more productive animals. And dairy cows would give more milk. This is a Japanese study done with dairy cows. You know, animals that approach people, their milk quality was better. Calm animals that are relaxed around people are more productive. There is scientific papers on this. And I'm leaving these slides with Zanella. You can look up these references pretty easily on Google Scholar. Now, animal memories are specific. And I wrote about this in my book, Animals in Translation. Now, I checked Amazon.com. That's our book website. Um, most of my books are available in electronic, unfortunately in English. I think I've got one Spanish book. 
Uh, but in Animals in Translation, I talked about how an animal is a sensory-based thinker. They're going to remember something as a picture, as a sound. And I am a visual thinker myself, so I can relate to this. And some research done in the US by Ronaldo Cook in Idaho showed that cattle's flight zone might be this big when I feed them from a truck. But if he gets out, takes the cattle to the corrals, that may be scary. The truck is familiar, the corrals are scary. They're thinking specific. And I really like this study from Europe by Leonard and Find, and you can look this paper up. If you habituate a horse to tolerate a blue and white umbrella, that does not transfer to the orange tarp. Umbrellas and tarps look completely different. Now, if you're working with show animals, people will say to me all the time, my horse or other animal was calm at home, and he went crazy at the show. But there's a lot of new scary things at the show, flags and bikes and balloons. You need to get them used to different things. Animal thinking is specific because it's sensory based. It's a picture. It's a sound. There was an elephant at the zoo who was terrified of pieces of equipment that ran with a diesel engine. That's a specific type of engine with a distinct sound. And if it ran with gasoline, had a different sound, I guess the ethanol would be the same. Um, but the elephant associated diesel-powered equipment with uh, being pushed around with construction equipment. Um, it's sensory-based. You want to understand animals. Get away from words. They're also very sensitive to tone of voice. High-pitched vocalizations usually are distressful. Now, there's a picture of a little boy with movies in his head. When I was a little kid, I'd be talking about autism in one of my other talks had no speech until age four, and everything I think about is a picture. That's how animals think. And there's even research that shows that um, ants remember in pictures. That's how they remember when they go out and forage. They'll turn around and like take a, a cell phone photo of landmarks, so, and then, then they can recognize it when they come back. It's really important that an animal's first experience with a new person, a new vehicle, a new piece of equipment is good. So the first time we bring them to the corrals, maybe feed them in it. But if the first time they come into the corrals, it's electric prods, dogs biting, people screaming, we need to get our mouth shut and stop screaming at animals, then they're gonna be afraid of the corrals. Now, sometimes we have to do something unpleasant, but it's really important that it's not the first experience with a new equipment or a new person. And there's an interesting old experiment that was done with rats that really showed this. It's in this paper I did on assessment of stress during handling and transport. There's the horse terrified of the black hat. When I put the black hat on the ground, it was less scary. But when I took the black hat, and I slowly brought it closer to my head. I could feel the horse tense up when the hat got to about here. That was getting closer to a match. I said, well, we better get rid of that hat because the horse was just getting ready to rear with me holding it. I did not want to be there. Also, look at the ear on that horse. That ear on that horse is facing me taking a picture. Now. There was an elephant at a zoo terrified of people, men with beards. He took the beard off. Animals will tend to pick out some obvious trait on a person, like maybe ladies with long hair are bad, or certain kind of jacket is bad, or a white lab coat is bad. Then you just take off the lab coat. If you can figure out what they're afraid of and just get, remove it, that can be really helpful. And horses that get scared when they confront something novel will be less scared if they have a familiar person with them. Now, animals don't like being alone. There are many accidents that happen with cattle when you get a lone animal by itself. And people get hurt and animals get hurt. 
Dogs will make categories. When I'm on the leash, I have to protect my owner. Or I'm in the back of the truck, I protect the truck. And when I'm off the leash, then um, uh, I can go play. With service dogs, if anyone works with service dogs, when the vest is on, it's work. If you want to play with the dog, take the vest off. It's really important that they have a clear category of work versus play. Now, a problem that you may have here, and that we have often in the Western United States, is many, many cattle are worked with a horse, and they've never seen a person on foot. Everything's done on a horse. They've never learned how to go in and out of a pen with a person on foot. So the flight zone might be from here to the edge of the curtain on the horse. But when they see the person on foot, the flight zone goes from here to that wall over there. Because the horse is familiar and safe, person on foot is frightening. And in small pens at auction markets and at the meat or abattoir, that can be really dangerous. Because you put them in a small pen, the person's still in the flight zone, they come back out over the top of the person. And so it's really important that cattle, before they leave home, uh, learn how to go in and out of a pen with a person on foot. We've uh, had some hideous accidents at the abattoir. And the cattle were beautiful and tame at the feed yard, beautiful, but they'd never been handled on foot. And then when they were, got off the truck at the abattoir, they were running down the alleys and then running back, real bad. Now, the way an animal's wired affects its behavior. Rapid movement makes the prey animal, cows and horses tend to make them run, but it makes the dog chase. It has the opposite behavior on the dog, probably connected to the seek system in the dog and the fear system in the horse. The emotional drivers, the seven pantscap emotions are the same, but they can be wired differently. For example, in, in people, when they hug each other, that's a good thing. But if you put your hand over the dog's shoulder, that's dominance. That's not lovey in dogs. Now, this is a camera they used in the movie that moves very slowly. You can take this camera and put it over the top of cattle, and they don't even notice it. But you have a rapid movement like that, they will notice that. Now, some of the first work I did with cattle is I looked for distractions in the environment that affected cattle movement, especially in places like corrals and races and working facilities, where you'd have cattle in a feedlot coming into a strange place. They'd never been there. And here we've got a plastic lid from a bucket in the middle of the road. And you're bringing the cattle down the road. The leader's going to stop. Now, I'd recommend that you remove that lid. But if you forgot to move it, then give your leader time to put the head down, take a look, wait for that head to come back up, and then when the leader goes, the other cattle will follow. I'd also recommend removing it. Uh, I've, we have a lot of facilities, uh, races, where there's a chain hanging down, and people don't remove it. I find I still have to talk about these things. People are not seeing it even when I give them checklists. I had a really fun trip to Ireland. They rented a big black helicopter, and we flew to a meat plant, to an abattoir. We landed on the front lawn, and the cattle refused to go in the stunning box. And the problem was, there were six holes in the door, about this big, and they could see motion on the other side of the door. Six pieces of tape, fixed it. Yeah, that was like pretty cool. That was two months ago. That was recent. I guess I'm still going to have a job. Non-slip flooring is essential. Animals get scared when they start slipping. Now, I want to say how good you are at seeing things in the environment. I want you to raise your hand if you noticed that that animal was looking at the sunspot. Now look at it carefully. He's looking right at the sunspot. 
He is showing you what he doesn't like in this environment. And at a different time of day, that sunspot will be gone. Maybe it's there at 10 o'clock in the morning, but in the afternoon, it's gone. I want to make you more observant. Watch your animal. When it's calm, it will look right at the jacket you put on the side of the race, the hose going across something, the metal strip on the ground. Uh, anybody notice something wrong there? That's, I told, I asked Cheryl, my assistant, to go on the internet and find cute picture of puppy at the vet clinic. That puppy is in a full brace position. He's not able to stand normally. You look online, you'll find lots of these pictures. If you put a mat on the table, and if at the vet clinic and you don't want to clean that mat, have the owner bring in a mat from home to put on the table. It's a real simple thing. Uh, one of the mistakes that's made with restraint equipment, squeezing animals too hard. Now, we've got a company here that has a hydraulic uh, squeeze chute. It's really important that that's adjusted because if an animal vocalizes, goes Moo! right when you catch him, something in the restraint, restrainer is hurting it. He's saying, ouch. And I'll talk about that more when I talk about the American Meat Institute. But you've got to have a non-slip floor also, if you have animals with a large flight zone and you have to stand next to the, to the uh, head holder, they see you there. That's one place where solid side can really make a difference. Okay, extreme fear behavior. Horse spooking at flags. Now, what would be the best way to train a horse to tolerate flags? Put the flags on the pasture fence and let the horse voluntarily approach. Don't shove it in his face. And sometimes the Arab, the more fearful horse, is also a high seeker too, and if he's allowed to approach, the Arab will be the first horse to touch the flags. But if you shove him at him, he'll be the first horse to get really excited. This is the thing. New things are both frightening and attractive. They're frightening when you suddenly shove it at them. They're attractive when the animal can voluntarily approach. So I put um, some paper uh, down in the middle of a pen of cattle, and they came up to it. But when the wind flipped the paper, they, they backed off. Then they came back, and I used to call that curiously afraid. And it turns out that a switch has been discovered in the brain. They can switch back and forth between fear or seek. Now, Dr. Zanella talked about fetal programming. If you do really bad things to the cow, and there's research done where you do really nasty, awful things to pregnant rats, what ends up happening is you make this switch more likely to go into the fear mode. Uh, this is the places where I first started working with meatpacking plant and big feed yards. And one of the questions I get asked, are cattle afraid of getting slaughtered? I found they behave the same way. And the stress levels vary from cortisol levels from high to low, but they're the same in both places. And a lot of the stress you get at a slaughterhouse is due to the novelty. And cattle that get afraid of something new at home like an umbrella, are going to be the cattle that also have the biggest stress response at the slaughter plant. There's a uh, trained heifer on the movie set. She was not trained to reflector boards. They trained her to white trucks, but they had not trained her to reflector boards, and they move in a very erratic way. And she almost jumped on top of me. Well, what's novel for one animal is normal home for another animal. And here's some pigs um, raised on uh, nice bedding, going and, and sniffing the plastic and chewing the plastic booty. The plastic booty was novel. That's why they're approaching it. You go down some countries, cattle grazing on the highways, nothing scares them. They've seen everything. And here you better get them used to flags. 
I think we'll skip over that. I'm going to skip some of these slides. Let's use really gentle ways to train the baby foal. Don't pat your animal. Stroke it. And you just stroke the mare, and then you just reach over and stroke the baby. We already discussed uh, some of our work on cattle fear and temperament. And you do not want to select everything to be the absolute calmest. Because the problem is, if you do that, you may lose some seek trait to get out and graze. And there's some research that's been done on that at New Mexico State University. I just want to finish up, I only have a few minutes left on genetics. If you over-select for any single trait, you will wreck your animal. You will mess up your animal. Now, look at how this fox looks like, the wild fox. And the Russian scientist Belyev wanted to select a fox that was gentle for fur hats. And after 20 generations of selecting foxes that approach and lick you instead of bite you, you ended up with a heavy-bodied, black and white, tame fox. But look at the difference in the shape. Traits are linked. And then you over-select for this trait, you get epilepsy. That's definitely an abnormality. We over-select our farm animals or our pet animals. We can get lameness. There's been a lot of problems in pigs with lameness, and I think it's connected to some of the carcass traits. Or you can get less disease resistance. There's always a trade-off. Nothing is free. Always a trade-off. There's a white layer. She looks nice when she's young. She looks like a rag when she gets old. That's genetics that made the feathers come off. And fortunately, they've been correcting some of this problem. Look at the difference here between the broiler chicken and the egg layer. They don't even look like the same species. Here's a very bad leg on a pig. They just selected for carcass traits, and they didn't, weren't selecting for leg conformation. We have got to select for good leg conformation on animals. And that's cattle getting a twisted claw. That's a defect. We need to stop it. That horse um, uh, definitely has neurological problems. Blue-eyed, it, it does a lot of tick behavior. Now, what happened to those pig's ears? <coughs> Another pig ate them. And I want to make sure we don't repeat the mistakes that were made by the US industry in the late 80s. They selected for three traits, rapid weight gain, gigantic big ribeye loin, and thin back fat. And they ended up with an aggressive pig Really aggressive, nasty pig, and it ate the ears. Well, that one's going to have trouble having its babies. Now, there's a pig with a big butt. And then you have pigs from China, from the Chinese breed, that are all reproduction, very little meat. There's always a trade-off. The lambs that had the strong immune function, they had more likely to have a single lamb. Weaker immune function, two lambs. There's another pig there. Let's end up with a bulldog. That's what it used to look like. How did we get to this monstrosity? I think it's a monstrosity. It has difficulty breathing, walking, uh, having its babies. And in 1938, that's what a bulldog looked like. How did we get to that? I call that bad becoming normal. The pig industry got into half of the pigs lame in the early 1990s. Fortunately, breeders are correcting the problem. And of course, I got to put my books up there. And hopefully, we have a little bit of time for questions. Those are available in electronic format, amazon.com. And these are not. <laughs> Actually, a domestic animals is available in electronic format. OK, hopefully, we have time for a couple of questions. And that's. Uh, do we have time for maybe one question? OK. I, I'm not, we have to use the mics so that. Nesse momento, eu gostaria que as pessoas que tivessem algumas questões que pudessem é, nos remeter para que possamos fazer as questões diretamente à doutora Tempo Grandin. Ah, a primeira pergunta está relacionando, em, pensando em bem-estar animal e manejo, é correto o uso de cães no pastoreio e manejo diário de ovelhas e bovinos? Isto é, 
Como fica o bem-estar utilizando predadores para cuidar das presas? Ok, dogs. Uh, I have seen dogs used very well out in the field where they work the edge of the flight zone. The cattle or the sheep can move away. Where I have problems with dogs is when cattle are confined in a single file race and a dog is constantly biting their, biting the legs of the cattle. They cannot get away and they get really stressed. They'll be doing a lot of tail switching, a lot of manuring and defecating. It also trains cattle to kick, which can get very dangerous for people. So in the corrals, let's put the dogs away. And um, well-trained herding dogs in the field, yes, that can be good. I've seen that very good. Uh, a segunda pergunta é, como você sugere que seja feita a desmama de bovinos e qual é o melhor manejo para evitar o estresse? The most important thing is um, making sure they are vaccinated. You know, what we've, we have found in the U.S., 45 to 60 days before they go to feed yards. If you wean calves on the truck and they arrive at a feed yard, you get lots of sickness. We have a number of ranchers that are using fence line weaning methods. That, you know, that can reduce some of the stress. But the most important thing, at least in the U.S. situation, for preventing sickness when cattle from the ranch go to the feedlot is to vaccinate and wean 45 to 60 days before they leave the ranch of origin. It's also good to train them to drink out of a water trough because their cattle have died of thirst because when the float controlled water trough went Shh, the animal was afraid of it and didn't drink out of it. Reunindo duas perguntas em uma outra, é, na sua opinião, é, qual é sobre rodeios e vaquejadas e a avaliação do bem-estar de touros nos rodeios? Well, the event that has the most problems is calf roping. Because, you know, if you, that's the most problematic event. Now, Ed Pager and I did some work on rodeos of bucking events, especially bulls. And what was found is that some bulls become almost a trained animal, and other bulls stay scared. But I watched bulls come into the, into the chute or the race at the Calgary Stampede and I let the cowboy sit on them for 10 minutes before the gate opened. And they learned exactly when they have to buck. And they actually want a bull that's fairly low fear. And there's a big difference between a good stock contractor and a bad one. If you have a bad stock contractor, you'll have bulls rearing up in the chutes and doing all kinds of bad things. If they work on actually training them right, then they go on the truck calm, and they, and they just act wild when, the, when it's time to buck. So on the bucking events, it depends upon, in my opinion, how it's done. And the bucking strap should just have sheep's wool on it and nothing else and it actually just turns into a stimulus, tell them to buck. They buck originally when you put the bucking strap on because it's novel. Okay, you, I showed you a slide of the saddle falling off. Well, that horse reacted quite badly when the saddle fell off. That's the same um, effect the bucking strap would have. It's sudden novelty. A seguinte pergunta é o seguinte, a senhora, o que a senhora acha sobre o uso de tecnologia de imagens para avaliar o comportamento do gado? Uh, yes, you can use that. In fact, in the U.S., um, there's a company called Aerosight that's installed video cameras over the stun box, at the unloading ramp, uh, at the handling race, and they do the American Meat Institute scoring system, which I'm going to explain in, in a talk tomorrow and they score slips and falls. They'll score electric problems. They'll score stunning, how well that is done, and that is done over the videos. Now, that does not completely replace live people visiting a plant, 
but it's really improved the handling. You know, I remember going into plants, people would be yelling and screaming and electric prods, and now I've gone into some of our largest um, meat plants, and it's very calm, and the cattle are just walking up the chute. So there's a place for using video imaging. Uma nova pergunta. Em sua opinião, é, em bovinos, quais os principais fatores que precisamos avaliar para selecionarmos linhagens mais dóceis? Well, in the U.S., we have been selecting for calmer cattle for almost 20 years. And especially in some of the mid middle parts of the U.S., the cattle are much calmer than they were uh, 20 years ago. That's already been done. Now, there's starting to be some concerns to make sure that when we select for calm cattle, that we do not lose other traits, such as get out and graze, take care of your calf. The behavior of licking and caring for the calf is a separate, one of those Jack Panskep emotions. We have to make sure we don't over-select for calmness. And when I first did, we did the research on the temperament 20 years ago, I warned people, I do not want to make beef cattle into dairy cattle that might get lazy and not take care of their calf and not get out and graze. You know, my approach is to get rid of, we call them hotheads, or really crazy cattle that just stir up the whole herd. Again, it's balance. You over-select for any trait, either a production trait or a behavior trait in either a farm animal or a, um, a, a pet animal, you are going to have a problem. Como evitar que os primeiros contatos entre humanos e animais sejam traumáticos em face aos manejos é, fundamentais como cuidado com o umbigo é, no neonato e na marcação? Sometimes if you have animal that's been really traumatized by something, and you can find out maybe it's the white lab coat, then you get rid of the white lab coat. That is easy. But there's other situations where, unfortunately, there's, this is common in dogs, where they get afraid of men because a man beat them up. So then what you have to do is to try to associate the being with the man with positive things like treats. And it's going to depend upon the genetics. If the animal has high fear genetics, it's going to be much more difficult to undo the damage than if the animal has, you know, low fear genetics. And the same thing is some this research on people like long and short serotonin transporter genes. We have to work on trying to prevent behavior problems. You take an Arab horse and you treat it badly, it's very difficult to fix the damage. Uh, this is where there's an interaction between how we handle it and the genetics. And the animal that's high fear, that's also called hot-blooded, or high-strung in English, is probably the animal that's going to get more damaged by rough treatment. Reunindo também duas perguntas numa única, é relacionada ao abate de animais, se durante o abate um animal cai antes de entrar na área de insensibilização, qual seria a melhor opção? E se os animais é, percebem essa, sentem essas quando serão abatidos e como eles enviam essa comunicação aos demais? Well, if an animal falls, I mean, hopefully it'll get back up again. Um, I had to answer the question: Do they know they're going to get slaughtered? So when I first started, I would go to um, the beef slaughterhouse, and then I'd go to the feed yard. They behaved the same way in both places. I've looked up many papers on cortisol levels at slaughter and at handling on a ranch or feed yard, locking them in, in this. And the values range from really high and bad to really, really low, but the range is the same in both places. Now, there is some evidence that there is um, kind of a smell of fear. Now, if it falls down and it gets right back up quickly and it's de slaughtered in two or three minutes, probably has no effect. But when I was working on equipment startups and something happens like an animal got stuck in a piece of equipment, 
and he was jammed in that piece of equipment for maybe 15 minutes, then the fear substance comes out in the urine and the saliva. Other animals will not go over it. There are two papers that show that this is true in pigs and cattle. And in both of the situations, if you read the method section of the paper, the stressful situation lasted for 10 or 15 minutes. It didn't last for two seconds. It wasn't a single shock with an electric prod. Uh, 15 seconds before they go into the stun box will not set this off. This would be difficult research to do because it would involve deliberately abusing animals, which is something I am not going to do. But I've operated a lot of equipment in the slaughterhouse, and what amazes me is I can open the door to the stun box, and if I got the lighting right, they walk right in. I've gone into plants where I put a light on the entrance of the stun box, they walk right in. Or I move a light to make a shiny reflection go away, and they walk right in. And when I put the six pieces of tape on the holes, they walked right in. They're very sensitive to what they see visually. You also have to make sure that air does not blow in their face as they come up the raceway. That's another thing you have to fix. And that they don't see people up front as they approach the box. And I find I get rid of the people and I get rid of the, the lighting problems. They go right in. E a última pergunta dessa manhã é, está relacionado se a senhora tem um passo a passo de como mudar o manejo de gado no curral. I have lots of stuff on that. We were going to talk about that tomorrow during the demonstrations. Um, I have a book on, uh, I have a website, grandon.com, my last name, grandon.com, and that has some information in Spanish on it. The diagrams are on it. Um, uh, there's videos online. Let's just discuss some of the things I'm going to talk about tomorrow on handling in the corrals. The big mistake that people make is putting too many cattle in the crowding or forcing area that's immediately in front of the single file chute. You also want to use following behavior. Wait until there's space in your single file so that when you bring animals up into the forcing or crowding area, that without stopping, they can just go into the race. Because if you fill the race and then fill the crowd pen when there's no place to go, all the cattle turn around. Because cattle have a natural behavior to go back to where they come from. So small groups coming into the forcing pen, that's going to require more walking and using the following behavior. Another principle is, we're going to just imagine that this is the head restrainer thing, and the race is right here. And there's cattle, like right here, coming this way. And I want to get a cow to go this way. So I'm outside the flight zone here. I step forward, quickly walk back by it like this. And I walk back by it in the opposite direction. It works. The cow's right here. I step forward, quickly walk back by it. That's one of the ways to get it in. Now, I do have some diagrams. Uh, you can come to me during the coffee break. I will draw it for you. Bom, dessa forma, nós encerramos a nossa sessão de apresentação nesta manhã. Gostaria de solicitar uma salva de palmas à doutora Temple Grande.